The title of this talk is Yoga in the 21st Century, Personal Practice, Global Impact. I thought a lot about this in terms of what the climate is of today, and I thought there's a lot of things to really debate about. I tried to think about what were things that we might be able to agree on about what's happening today. And the first thing that I came up with was that perhaps we could all agree, perhaps, we could all agree that change, change is really happening. And change is happening. Now, of course, we know that change has always happened. But I would like to propose that change is really happening. <laughs> like it's happening bigger than it's ever happened on the planet before. There hasn't been change like what's happening now. It creates a climate that is um, edgy, um, scary, unpredictable, freaky, challenging, requires us to be on a constant edge of learning. I'm just thinking, like right now, I'm, I'm thinking of so many different things. Six months ago, I bought a plasma TV. I went in, it was plasma, digital, which one should I get? And the guy said, oh, don't worry, because in six months, everything's going Blu-ray. You know, it was like, Blu-ray, oh, Blu-ray, okay. So, so much for that. My, my you know, six-month TV is now obsolete, as we all know, for those of us who have dinosaur computers at two years old. And I just uh, today decided that I was going to get a new cell phone because my daughter, who is 10, texts. And when I'm away, I really need to get up to speed, and I need to text her. So she can send me messages that say, Dad, U, letter U, letter R, G-R, number 8. And I can type back letter U, letter R, number 2, right? <laughs> so I'm going to get a new phone, all right? These are just some examples of what change means today. But that's just technologically. We have economic change on the rise. We have political change on the rise. We have... Well, we could go on and on and on and on. Hopefully we can agree on change is big, like never before, like never before. So let's set that aside. The second thing that I thought about that's unique about the climate today is that for the first time on the history of the planet, we are facing global, global challenges, global complications, global problems. It used to be the problems were local, and that meant that local famines, local wars, local politics, local beliefs, local religions, local food shortages. But for the first time on the planet, we are facing global problems, where the problems that we face face all of us, whether we are rich or poor, whether we're Chinese or Japanese or American or New Zealanders. These problems face us all, like... Are we going to have air to breathe? <laughs> Will we have water? The food, food source is depleting. Overpopulation is coming to, you know, we have a global economy. We are faced with global problems that require global solutions. That's the only way we can handle global problems is global solutions. Now that I've got you all very sad and depressed <laughs> about our current state of affairs, set all of that aside for a moment because I asked myself, with this climate of today, with change and global problems facing us, what does it mean to be a yoga teacher today? What does a yoga teacher do in the midst of this? What does it mean to be a Kripalu yoga teacher? What difference can we make? Do we make a difference in this huge uh, climate, that, that this backdrop of today. What can we do as yoga teachers to make a difference in this? As I started to think about that, as many of you know about me, I like to take a sentence apart because before we can actually answer or ponder that question about being yoga teachers and what difference we can make, we have to have some agreement about what does yoga mean. Now, here I am, I've been on this quest in this room for 30 years, and I have been asking this question, what is Kripalu Yoga? What is yoga for many, many years? So we have people who are smiling at me because I've been in meetings and meetings, and we've tried to create 
curriculum and methodology. We've tried to create marketing identities. We've tried to create, I've, so many times I've been asked the question, what is Kripalu Yoga? And I'm sure as yoga teachers, you guys get that question all the time also. What is Kripalu Yoga? Well, then there's the question, what is yoga? And I would like to say that one of the brands of Kripalu Yoga and one of the reasons why that question remains, and I hope forever remains, so slippery, is because for Kripalu Yogis, the quest really isn't about a brand. It really is about what is yoga? What is union? What is union? What is it? That is a question, a quest. What is union? As we know, lots of people think that yoga is an exercise, and it is, and it's much more also. And this question, what is yoga, really started by Swami Kripalu Apaji. He started his quest, his question, through despair, just like me, and probably like many of you. Because when we look out at the world today, it's appropriate to look out at today's situation and situations hundreds of years ago and go, yuck, what difference do I make? Can I make a difference? What's it all about? What, what, what's happening here? What is yoga? Is there such a thing as truth? Is there something that's unchangeable? All I see is chaos. We are headed to hell in a handbasket, as they say. Okay, wow. What do, what do we do about that? Is there anything we can do? And really to be on that quest, that inquiry, that, that experimentation, that, that path to really answer that question with real fervency. And Bapaji, Swami Kripalu, had incredible fervency to answer that question. I'm glad to say that he died with it unanswered. He died still questing. And he was one of the people that I feel knew more than anybody. <laughs> and yet he died not knowing on a quest. So the heart of the word question is quest, being on a quest, not knowing, not having the answers to this crazy, crazy predicament that we have ourselves in. And what does it mean to be able to not be in answers, but to be in questions? One of the reasons why I really like yoga, as opposed to like um, religious doctrine, per se, is because yoga does not come out with a set of beliefs and say, here's what you should believe. And if you believe it, you're in. And if you don't believe it, you're out. Or generally what's associated with beliefs like this is, if you believe it, you go to heaven. If you don't believe it, you go to hell. Or some other great predicament of fear associated with, with doctrine. But with yoga, there's simply a set of practices. Practices and maps. And the practices simply say, you know what, if you do this practice, just do it. It doesn't matter what you believe. Just do it and see what happens. Just like the Nike saying, just do it okay? and see what happens. And through the practice, you may have some experience, some experience beyond whatever belief it is that you have. And if you hold a belief that's worth holding, most likely it will strengthen it. So the other thing about having practice, which I really like about yoga, is that it also sets out these maps. And maps are really great too because they're not doctrine. I mean, like if someone hands you a map because you're going to New York, you know, you don't have to go to New York. It's just a map. Just helpful if you want to get there. You know, it's really a great thing. You don't have to go there. You don't even have to believe it. You could say, ah, oh, that map is trash. But there are these maps. And to name a number of those maps, some significant ones that I really like and count on, the koshas. The koshas is a map of human development and a way of looking at the self that's unique and different than 
most Western psychology, the chakras, the doshas, the gunas, the shariras, the vayus. Now maybe I see lots of people going. <laughs> so you choose a map that you like, and any one of those maps works. And when you start to work with some of these maps you see, and I really like this about yoga too, these maps don't conflict. Unlike when you go to often Western psychology and you study Freud's process of development or Erickson's model of human development, they don't go together very well. They conflict. But when you study the koshas and then you study the chakras, they really light each other up. They're just different viewpoints of the same experience. Because through practice, people had experiences and then they mapped out what the experience was. And so with these maps, you can guide yourself along through these yogic experiences and see sort of where you are. And either they fit or they don't fit. But interestingly enough, these maps have been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Very true and tested. And I like that. You don't have to believe a thing. Just do it and see what happens. So that's the personal practice piece. With that sort of framework, I have something that I would like to get across. This started with a discussion with Brahmanand, Dr. Don Stapleton, as we were working on curriculum for our yoga teacher trainers. These concepts that we use with the teacher trainers are really about this question, what is yoga? What's our job about? We put this together, and I, I used Don uh, Don's work, Patanjali's work, the Bhagavad Gita, and also I'm going to mention one other person, Harry Palmer, not to be confused with Harry Potter, and my own musings to put together this um, conglomeration of the learning process. This learning process was something we started, again, passing on to the yoga teacher trainers, and then I thought, you know what? The 500-hour people should really get this in the modules. So two modules ago, I started bringing it into the 500 hours. Then I thought, what am I doing? I should bring it here tonight because it really is the core for me of what yoga is. And I'm going to bullet some key points here and just take out some of, for me, the juicy bullets. And they're going to be big things to swallow. I have said before, I like to be provocative. And at the word, key word in provocative is provoke. You may find yourselves being provoked by what I say. So, um, the Gita, crash course. The Bhagavad Gita, very, very old, and one of the definitive texts on yoga. It does not mention asana. At once, they describe, I believe, a, a meditation posture. I think there's one chapter where they describe the posture of sitting in meditation. But that's it. We're back to this question. Wait, definitive text on yoga. What is yoga? And here we are walking around thinking it's all about the asana. And it's not even mentioned in the Gita, okay? But at the core concept, the core beginning, same thing, starts with Arjun's despair. Isn't that interesting? Chapter one, Arjun's despair. Isn't it interesting, Bapaji's despair? Isn't it interesting, my despair? Isn't it interesting of the current situation today? And I have to say, just looking at my, I have a, a 15-year-old and a 10-year-old. And they are faced with an incredible challenge today. It's pretty daunting to look out at the world today. If they're watching the news slightly, it's daunting. And it was daunting when we were growing up also, but I think way more daunting today. Again, it's like, what do they need? What do they need amidst all of this change? In the Gita, begins with despair, and then, right away, Krishna says to Arjun, here's the deal. All suffering comes from ignorance of the true self. You are infinite, eternal, and whole. All suffering, fear, anxiety comes from your forgetting that you are infinite, eternal, and whole. Now, as far as I'm concerned, end of story. Okay? There, there it is. It, he lays it out in the first chapter and boom, says, boom, 
You never died. You never could die. You could never kill. You could never be killed. You are infinite, whole, and eternal. Bapaji was on the path of Sanatana Dharma. And the path of Sanatana Dharma, for those of you who do not know, is the path of searching for the eternal truths, for infinite truth, for unchangeable truth, for everlasting truth, if there is such a thing. If there is such a thing. And he was fervently on that quest and found and found and found many seeming answers. But the quest kept getting larger and larger and larger, like it does for anybody truly on the quest. Let's just go to Einstein, for example, who was also on the quest for infinite truth through science, as was Bapaji, the science of yoga. And Einstein said for every question that he answered, a million more arose. For one answered, a million more opened. Okay, so here's the point. We don't know much. And we are infinite, whole, and eternal. All right, so let's just set that big concept aside for a second. Take time to swallow that and move on to Patanjali the next definitive text on yoga. So Patanjali also, oddly enough, does not really mention hatha yoga. He does mention asana as part of the eightfold path, but he just mentions it. He doesn't tell us how to do it. He doesn't tell us what it is. It's the physical practice. It's taking care of the body. Asana, part of the eightfold path. And Patanjali lays out this process of learning better than any one I've ever known a gradient approach to the process of samyama and how we as human beings create our realities. And it's amazing and time-tested and outrageous. In Patanjali's sutras, there's one key, well, two that go together, key concepts that I really like to latch on to, which is he said that we change two ways. There are two ways we change authentically, deeply. One is through practice. So here we are again, yoga. One is through practice. That's how we learn, through practice. And then he gives a great description of practice. He says practice is continuous struggle over long periods of time. Okay, <laughs> Continuous struggle over long periods of time. That's not like what we think of as practice. We think of, oh, I want a perfect practice. I practice perfectly. You know? Oh, I do yoga every day. You know? But I, my practices have been continuous <laughs> struggle. And practice is a continuous struggle. And why is that continuous struggle? It's because in order to learn something new, we have to just wear away at all the things that we think we know in order to experience something out of that realm of what it is that we think we know. We've locked ourselves up in these concepts and identities and belief structures about who we are and where we think we are. We're out of the mystery. We're out of the question. And we have to practice and practice and practice and practice till bink, maybe there's a crack and we have an experience of infinite Nice, infinitenessness, whatever, what, of that. And then, whew, wow, through lots of practice, some crack happens. So that's one way he says it happens. But then he says it happens through practice or it could happen through a flash of intuitive insight and knowledge or prayer. Grace could just happen. Bing, bing. You could just be lifted right out of your current state of knowing, ding, and have some new shift happen. And then, going back to the Gita now to tie these all together, he lets us know that the more we believe we are infinite, whole, and eternal, the more intuitive flashes we will have. Because when we believe we are infinite, we are connected to the mystery to the question, and we can be fine not knowing where we are, who we are, what the hell is going on. 
And in the state of not knowing, something can happen. Some experience of knowing can happen. That just like Einstein will open up a million more fabulous, wonderful, not knowing questions and lead us into the next inquiry. A number of years ago, Brahmanan brought this to us. Patanjali's first sutra, just like in the Gita, first chapter, boom, it's all there. And in Patanjali's sutras, same thing. First sutra, it's all there as far as I'm concerned. Atta, yoga, nushasanam. Atta, now, yoga, union, nushasanam. And nushasanam has been described in many different ways. Nushasanam is often described as now the practice of yoga, which as we just learned is continuous struggle for a long, I was going to swear here, for a long time. Atta yoga nushasanam. Now the inquiry of yoga. Now the inquiry question of yoga. So that was Brahmanan's bringing to us. Now the questioning of yoga. And I also like to add to that, now the quest of yoga. Isn't it true that we're all on a quest? One of the things that I delight in is that Bapaji brought together a group of people who are questing. It's what we have in common. We are not people of answers. We're people on a quest, and we share that same path, and we recognize it in each other. The willingness not to know. The willingness to not have an answer. This isn't a place of big doctrine. This isn't a place of fundamentalism. It's a place that actually combats fundamentalism and opens up to change and opens up to who are we really? What inside you is unchangeable? And this is who Bapaji attracted, all of you, all of us. It's what we have in common. I like that. There were years where we went through a Kripalu Yoga identity crisis and an inferiority crisis, thinking that our yoga was not nearly as good as other people's because they branded there so well and it got, was so pretty and colorful and selling really well because it was much clearer. Like, for example, I think Bikram's is a great example. It's real clear. Bikram's is wonderful, franchised just like McDonald's, and it's 26 postures done in this order. You have to buy into the franchise. This is true. You can get sued if you don't do it correctly. And I, 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 just so you know, I love Bikram's yoga. I do it all. I'm not dissing Bikram's yoga. And Bikram was here for many years teaching us, so we incorporated a lot of Bikram's yoga. Bikram's yoga, 26 postures, need to be done in this order. Room needs to be this temperature. Basically, there's a script, and if you're from the script, you're not doing Bikram's yoga. That's very cool. It sells. Now, here's the interesting thing. As a Kripalu yogi, I can go into a Bikram's yoga class, and I'm still doing Kripalu yoga. But a Bikram's yogi cannot come to a Kripalu yoga class and say they're doing Bikram's yoga. So what's the difference here? <laughs> I think there's a difference, and I think that's because we are about being open to the questions and to the inquiry in our own bodies, in our own breath, in our own mind and emotions, in our own witness consciousness, and in our own souls. And what I just listed was the koshas, just going through the koshas. And that as yoga teachers, we help people increase or turn up their volume on their awareness in each of those koshas. And postures is just a lovely little vehicle for learning how to learn. And when we become a learner about the mystery, we become more alive. And when we're more alive, we're freer, we're more excited, and we're connected more to being an infinite self. And health happens because there's less to fear. That's all pretty cool. I think. I'm proud of that. And still we struggle with what is Kripalu Yoga? I dread it. I get interviewed a lot by, you know, Yoga Journal and Self Magazine. What is Kripalu Yoga? And I go, oh, do you have 45 minutes? Can you come to a class? I can't just, it's not one word. It's not a script. 
It's an experience. It's an experience. Just like the infinite is an experience. I mean, there's many things like, for example, that we can make finite. Like, I'm just looking, something in the room. That lamp, that lamp is finite. And we can all go, yep, there's that lamp. There's the lamp. Yep, we can all agree, there's the lamp. But now, just stop for a moment. Let's ponder an infinite amount of lamps. (laughs) Just stay with it. An infinite amount of lamps. So that's an experience. Infinite is an experience that happens now and keeps expanding, and now and keeps expanding, and now and keeps expanding, and now and keeps expanding. And the moment you stop it, you're off infinite. You've gone to finite. As Kripalu yogis, we open up this experience of not knowing and being in the infinite self. That's part of it. And that greases the learning experience. So I've mentioned now the Gita. I've mentioned now Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And now I'd like to mention Brahmanand. He is working currently on a book, and this is its first announcement, and I asked him if I could say it, on experiential learning process, the experiential learning process, part of which I'm, I'm going to massacre horribly tonight for him. And um, I'm urging you all to buy it when it comes out. With that, I'm going to start into some of these key concepts that we have been working with the yoga teacher trainers on. And the first concept is that the self is multidimensional. So that sounds simple, but the average Westerner sits in a real clear knowing that this is the self, just right here. What you see is what you get. This is the self. And when we get into the maps of yoga, we start to learn like the koshas. Wow, there is a physical self, and it resides in a physical time and space. There's a breath kosha, and the moment we get into the pranamaya kosha, it's a little freed up from time and space, but still in the body, somewhat, than in the element of air. Then... There's the mental-emotional kosha, the manamaya kosha. Now we're into the realms of thoughts and feelings and emotions, which travel at a not much different speed. Then there's the vijnanamaya kosha, the higher self, the witness consciousness, the observer, the, the quiet, still voice within. And that's in a whole different time and space. And then there's the soul, the anandamaya kosha, out of time and space altogether, the infinite self. So how does this multidimensional being relate to, you know, how does it all coexist together? That's a fabulous map. That's, to me, a very exciting map. I I love that map. And it's, it's proven really true for me. It's been a great guide for looking at human beings and how we learn. So the trick is, is that we're learning on all these different levels. We can't just say learning is easy and it happens in this one way. We're learning at a soul level. We've come in with soul information, perhaps, from before. We're learning at physical levels. We're learning at mental, emotional levels. We've got a higher mind that's watching the whole damn thing. I mean, it's, it's a crazy circus going on inside here. And that's a cool, cool thing. So now we throw in that the learning process is multidimensional. So not only are we multidimensional, but learning is multidimensional. It's not just one, two, you know, two plus two equals four. It's complex. Now, just to throw things a little screwier, the multidimensional self in a multidimensional learning process is messy. Messy. And I love this word messy because we, or the mind, loves things perfect. We like the answers. We like the answers before we go out on our quest. Tell me, teacher, what should I get before I go out? What should I know? And then, of course, when we get told by the teacher, you should get this, then what do you think we go out and get? We get that. Well, that's not a quest. Go and find out. See what you get. No answers. Go find out. Go quest. See what make a mess. Make a mess. Sitting in this chapel many years ago, I walked in here in 1981 at Summit Station and wanted to be enlightened, wanted to be a saint. I heard the call that said, many are called, but few are chosen. 
and I was going to be one of those that would be chosen. I would do whatever it took. I would be in the front row. I would do practices till the end of my days. I would breathe until my sinuses were bleeding. I would do whatever it took. And partly that was spurred because I was really unhappy. I was really not happy with the state of the world. And it was like, please, God, get me out of here so I never have to be born again into this cycle of birth and death. I've heard that if I get enlightened, I'm never born again. Yes, I will do that. <laughs> and sitting right here, actually right about there in this chapel one day, I realized I got what I came for, that I could speak to God at any time and hear God's guidance, and that I no longer needed to go anywhere, that I was here, and if I lived to be a 100 years or had a 100 more lifetimes, whatever God wants in the infinite isness. And if he killed me now, that would be fine. And if I was an elephant for three years, that would be fine. And, you know, whatever, whatever it took, it just didn't matter. Didn't matter. So I call that period of my life at Kripalu my ascension. Because I was trying to ascend to get off the planet. And in that moment, sitting right here in this room during the chanting, I heard God say to me in that way that God speaks without a voice, well, now that you've been trying to get off the planet for so long, why don't you get on it? Go make a mess. And it was like, oh, after years of trying to be perfect? What? Permission to go make a mess? Well, I did. <laughs> I did. I made a big mess. I'm living a mess. I got married. I have two kids. I have bills. And let me just tell you, it is much easier to be a renunciate and to own nothing and to say you're non-attached than it is to actually have homes and cars and problems and kids to say you're non-attached. I have a mess. I have, as Mark Twain said, the full catastrophe, <laughs> and I'm glad to have it because it just is what it is, a mess. <laughs> like you, I'm making it up as I go along. You know, I really don't know anything. So I wanted to say a little bit more about the mystery just to get us on this planet. Looking at reality as we know it, we have the physical self, we have this podium, we have the floor, we have our clothes, we have the lights in this room, we have the ground that we stand on. It's all made up of atoms. Atoms are mini universes, protons, neutrons, electrons, they orbit around each other. And as our scientists tell us, they're 99.9% .9 space. Okay, so. First, we now know that most of reality is not very real at all, right? Because that's just atoms that makes up all of what we call reality. And in these prayers that I just chanted us, lead us from the unreal to the real. Maybe we have to shift our idea of what we think real is. Maybe that's this process of yoga. So, we think this is all real. And so that's the, you know, quantum physicists are busy trying to figure out what's that old 0.1% stuff. And most of them agree that it's light that actually vibrates at frequencies that appears to be real. It, it puts on a little light show. So you and I in this whole room is a weird little light show. And we're all in it. And to go one step further, they say that the light show is actually created and manipulated by thought. Uh-oh. Whose? Okay, so we're busy trying to figure out what this reality is about because, hey, if our scientists or technologies can figure out what that 0.01% stuff is, maybe we'll get to the point where we can actually manipulate it with thought more consciously than we have. Maybe we could say things like, let's get rid of all the cars. Let's um, regreen the earth and have trees. Let's, um, I'd like to go to Chicago. Let's um, build temples. What if, 
What if we're on a paradigm shift so large that that might be our new reality? What aspect of our self would we have to be associated with to pop into that reality? What attachments might we have to let go of to pop into that new way of being? It would be, are you infinite, whole, and eternal? Or are you your car and your house and your all these weird little things that we think we know where we are? It's just hysterical to me. <laughs> I mean, think of it. We're in this room. Even if you believe that this is real, we're in this room. We're on a planet. What does that mean? A planet that floats. It floats in the middle of what? We're in the middle of a solar system with other planets that float around it. And we happen to be on the very far end of the boondocks of the galaxy. We're in the boonies, folks. Way, way boonies. Our, our little solar system, way boonies of the galaxy. And guess what? That galaxy is in the far, far, far boonies of the universe. And guess what? The universe that we're in is in the far, 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 far boonies of a supernova. And guess what? That supernova is in the far, far, far boonies of the edge of a black hole. So what the hell does that mean? <laughs> we don't know. We don't know where we are. We don't know who we are, and we don't know what we're up to. <laughs> it is so much more fun to be insane. It is much more fun to be insane. And that's the point of this whole thing. When we accept the mystery and the quest for truth inside of this, we are more alive. And it is much more exciting not to know than to be a person with all the answers. As a matter of fact, just think about it. Who likes people with all the answers? <laughs> Who likes a know-it-all? Nobody. Nobody. So, where I last left off was the learning process is multidimensional. The multidimensional self in a multidimensional learning process is messy. Everyone's learning process is unique. We all do it differently. Let's acknowledge that about each other. We're all making messes, and we all do it uniquely. <laughs> that gives us all a lot of leeway. And it's really nice being in relationship to say, wow, what a mess. You made a nice mess. Let me tell you about my mess. And I'm learning. I'm learning. I hope. I'm learning. So everyone's process is unique. Now here's the clincher that may take some getting on to. The learning process is endless. The learning process is endless. It's infinite. It doesn't end. Because if we are infinite, whole, and eternal, then the learning process must be infinite, whole, and eternal. Infinite. So there was a time, if you were here, to think that, oh, someday I'm going to be, oh, I know it, I know it. Oh, whoo, thank God, I know it all. Oh, I know it. It happened. I know it. I know it. Whoo. Safe now, I know it. If you're on that path, hopefully it will never happen to you. Because the moment you do know it, some mess will show up to prove that you don't know it. Because this is a crazy, infinite mystery of not knowing. A quest. Now the quest of yoga. Now the inquiry of yoga. Now the experimentation of yoga. Now the exploration of yoga. Now the practice, the continuous struggle of yoga. That's the first sutra of Patanjali Sutra. And as again, that's all we need as far as I'm concerned. We could end there. But I won't. <laughs> the last piece of this is learning to love. Learning to love the endless, messy, multidimensional process of learning while inhabiting a multidimensional self is the goal. Learning to love learning. Learning to love learning endlessly is the goal. So give up thinking that there's going to be a day where you get it. 
like you got it. Getting it is really loving that there's nothing to get, and there's so much to get. What a fun paradox. There will never be an end to what there is to get. The more you know, the less you know. The more you know, the less you know. It's a good thing. That's all there is to get. So the more we learn to enjoy the process of learning, the more alive we become. And certainly we have all seen, whether you are 20 or whether you are 80, someone who has stopped learning is dull. You get a 20-year-old who's all packaged up, he's got all the right answers, they're dead, as far as I'm concerned. You get someone like, I'm, I'm just in this moment thinking of Joseph Campbell, who, you know, the power of myth at whatever he was, 89 or 92 when he did those things. This man is on fire. He is on live, alive on a quest. He has a gazillions of insights and inquiries, but that man knows we are in a mystery beyond. And he points it out and had a willingness to go anywhere. He would be eating bugs with aborigines and shrinking heads with uh, uh, shamans. And I mean, you know, you name it, he did it. That's pretty cool. He had to be associated with something besides his identity to go into that kind of change and to experience that kind of reality. Kripalu yoga is the science of learning, the process of learning. Kripalu yoga is the science of learning, the process of learning. Yoga is the science of learning, the process of learning. When we get people as yoga teachers into their body and we start helping them turn up the volume of their awareness on their physical sensations, great. And then we start to turn up their volume on their experience of their breath sensations, great. And then we start turning up their awareness on the volume of their mental, emotional chatter and addictions and mind, great. And then we stop helping them see that there's an inside self that watches the whole thing, great. And somehow they have an experience of soul and love and feeling okay and free and safe in this crazy, crazy chaos and mystery, great. We teach people how to learn, how to learn and how to increase awareness, and how to enjoy the process. As you know, so many people come in not enjoying being in their body. Just the whole experience of being in the body is painful. And for us to help to somehow make that an enjoyable experience, and it starts there and raises, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Kripalu Yoga Teachers. Teach others the process of learning to love the process of learning. And that's all of you. Whether you're aware of it or not, my hope is that this is what you're doing, and I know that it is what you're doing, because I see and hear the miracles all the time. It comes back to me like ripple effects, and I am profoundly moved and grateful. So now back to the problems <laughs> of change and global, global problems. If we're going to deal with the change that's hitting this planet, we have got to be associated with an infinite eternal self. There's got to be someone here having a good time when all this change is going on. There's got to be someone who can still find a smile. There's got to be someone who can still breathe. There's got to be someone who can still say, hey, gang, over here, over here. We're doing it. Yeah, things are changing, but we're still fine. We're still fine. We're flowing along on the new quest, whatever it is, because there's a lot of unpredictability today. And my hope is that you are those people, that you are a beacon of light during all of this change because you are seated on your quest, because you don't know the answers, and you're fine with that because you're willing to be in a mess, and that's okay, because it's just the truth. And all those people attached to perfection and attached to the right way, when it all comes crumbling down, because it will, it has to, may run to you. So if you're worried about your profession in the future, 
I don't think we have much to worry about, gang. I think we are going to be highly, highly sought after. Global problems. Global solutions is the only answer to global problems, and global solutions require that we see ourselves as one, not separate, because we will have to come up with a solution that we all agree on. Now, some people would say, that's not possible. But I don't think God has never put, let's just say this, God has never put a personal challenge in front of me that I couldn't handle. And I thought, oh God, this is way too big for me. And yet, there's never been a challenge in front of me that I couldn't handle. And I like to believe that in mass consciousness, we have created a global problem because we can create a global solution. We have to create a global solution. We must. And if not the people in this room, who? Who? I mean, I work here because I believe this is the place that I can make the biggest impact on that change on the globe. And that's because of you. That's because I believe that believing in the infinite, eternal, whole self, believing in the path of love that Swami Kripalu initiated and began and inspired and created and drew me to, that that's the place where I need to be. And I hope that it makes a difference in some way, shape, or form. I would like you to take a moment and hold the hands of someone next to you. And close your eyes. And take a moment to drop into the experience of the infinite. Expand your consciousness out into all that is. out to the angels, out to the beings and guides that administrate this planet, out to the infinite stars that go on and on forever and ever, and continue to expand for a moment in the experience of eternity. You are larger than this. There is no end to you. And our peace and our safety and our global solutions depend on us knowing this and living from this experience and loving the endless, messy learning process that goes on forever in this crazy, chaotic mystery.